Hi there, this is Stu Schwartz of MasterMathMentor.com. This is the first in a series of videos, AB01-02. The topic is Introduction and Tangent Lines. It covers the AB manual pages 1 through 4. Welcome to the first in a series of YouTube videos on Advanced Placement AB Calculus. My name is Stu Schwartz, and I will help guide you through this amazing math course. Let's start with a question. What exactly is calculus? Stop the video and write down an answer. You wrote absolutely nothing, right? Let me get this straight. You took all these years of algebra and geometry and pre-calculus just to get to AP Calculus, and you have no idea what the course is about? Before we get into what calculus is, let's look at several examples of what you could do, BC, before calculus, and what you will be able to do by the end of this course. Let's look at example one. We are told that on April 15th, many people mail in their taxes to the Internal Revenue Service. The town of Newton monitors the number of tax forms that are mailed from their post office. The total number of tax forms that are mailed from the Newton post office on April 15th is modeled by the function m of t equals 2500 over 1 plus 13e to the negative 0.25t, where t is the number of hours from 12 midnight on April 14th through 12 midnight on April 15th, and m of t is the total number of letters mailed that day from the Newton Post Office. So what kind of questions can we answer from a pre-calculus point of view? The first thing we can do is to graph the function and we'd probably use a graphing calculator to do it. And we see the graph starts out low, and then it, it builds and builds and seems to level off. With pre-calculus, you could find the number of tax forms mailed by 9 p.m. on April 15th. The answer is simply M21, which is 2,340. But with calculus, we can do so much more. I won't explain how these answers came about. After all, that's the goal of the course. But with calculus, we could find the average rate of tax forms mailed between 6 and 9 p.m. That answer is 51.9 forms per hour. We could find the rate that the tax forms are coming into the post office at 9 p.m. That answer is 37.3 forms per hour. We, we could find a time of day when the letters are coming into the post office at the fastest rate, and what is that rate? And the answer is approximately 1015 at the rate of 156.245 forms per hour. And we could find what is the total number of hours that all the forms sit in the post office, and the answer is 33,939 hours. Obviously, with calculus, we can do very much more than with pre-calculus. Example 2 states that a new car called the Sexus has its plant next to its only dealership. Cars are sold directly from the plant. Suppose at the start of the month of May, there are 100 cars on the lot waiting to be sold. Cars come off the assembly line at the rate of a of t equals 20t times 2 raised to the negative 0.2t. And cars are sold at the rate of s of t equals 30 plus 15 cosine of 0.2t, where t represents the day of the month. May 1st, t equals 0. May 31st, t equals 30. We can graph the function using a graphing calculator. As we can see in blue, a of t goes up and hits a maximum and then starts to come down reasonably quickly, while 
s of t starts at a high rate, goes down, and then comes back up. With pre-calculus, we can do several things. We can find the rate that the cars are produced on May 15th, and the answer is a of 14 equals 40.2 cars a day. And we can find that the rate that cars are sold on May 15th, and the answer is S of 14, which is 15.9 cars a day. With calculus, we can answer many more questions. For instance, we can find the total number of cars available to be sold in the month of May. The answer is approximately 1,057 cars. We can find the total number of cars sold in May. The answer is 879 cars. We can find the average number of cars produced per day in May. In May, And the answer is 31.9 cars a day. We can find the day when there will be a maximum number of cars waiting to be sold and approximately what that number is. And the answer is on May 22nd, there will be 355 cars on the lot. And we can find out the day when there is a minimum number of cars waiting to be sold and approximately what that number is. And the answer is on May 4th, there will be 164 cars on the lot. When real life quantities change, they either change in a positive direction or a negative direction. There are words to describe change. For instance, increasing for a positive change, decreasing for a negative change. And when things do not change, a typical word might be staying constant. So turn off this video and then go to page two and see if you can fill in the table with 15 words describing positive change, 15 words describing negative change, and 10 words describing no change. When stuck, think of real-life areas where change occurs, such as academics, sports, economics, biology, music. Here is a list that I generated. I'm sure you came up with others. Feel free to stop the video and look at each one to make sure that they indicate a positive change, a negative change, and no change. At this point, stop the video and on page two, write down four things that are changing about you at this moment in time. Here are four possible ones. Your height is increasing, your fingernails are growing, your hair is growing, and your knowledge is increasing. Notice that all of these are positive changes. As you get older, you may find that some will decrease. Older people usually get shorter, and certainly the hair starts to fall out. Many times change occurs, but it happens slowly. For instance, we do not know that our height has increased until we compare it with our height last year. We're not aware that our fingernails are growing, but we do know that when we find that it's necessary to cut them. The same thing is true when we have to cut our hair. Also, change does not have to occur at a constant rate. For instance, a child's height can stay constant for quite a while, and then he or she can just shoot up very quickly. Also, a student can cram for a test and increase his knowledge very quickly. AP Calculus is a complex course. But in the course, we only study four topics, limits, derivatives, integrals, one kind, and integrals, another kind. All of these four topics are related to the concept of change, and everything we do in this course will be related to those four concepts. Although we will be involved in many details, everything comes down to these four concepts. So your job in the course will be to answer the question, 
which of these four topics does the problem I'm attempting to solve apply to? After an opening chapter, to give you a feel for calculus right from the beginning, our formal study of AP Calculus begins with limits. Limits oversees all of calculus. Everything we do in the course is based on limits. The course is then divided into two sections, differential calculus and integral calculus. Differential calculus comes first and is concerned with derivatives. Approximately 60% of the course is devoted to differential calculus. The last 40% is devoted to integral calculus, which is concerned with taking the two different types of integrals. Differential calculus is concerned with one problem only called the tangent line problem. If you are given a curve, as we see in blue, you want to find the equation of the tangent line, as we see in red. Integral calculus is concerned with only one problem, called the area problem. Given two curves, we want to find the area between them. So on the indicated graph, we have two very different looking curves. We want to find the area of the red region. Back when you took geometry, you learned that a line is tangent to a circle if it intersects the circle at one point. So in the figure shown, the line is tangent to the circle at point P. But when we have other types of curves, we need a different definition. The idea of tangent lines is crucial to your understanding of differential calculus, so we have to have an accurate idea of what its meaning is. There are many rough ideas of what a tangent line is that are subtly incorrect. So turn off the video and in the space provided on page 3, see if you could come up with a definition of a line tangent to a curve. You may have said that a line is tangent to a curve if it crosses the curve at one point. That's not correct. In the diagram shown, the line crosses the curve at point P, but it is clearly not a tangent line. You may have written that a tangent line to a curve must cross the curve only once. This too is wrong. The line shown in the figure is tangent to the curve at point P, but it also crosses it at two other points. You may have written that a line is tangent to a curve if it touches the curve at one point but does not cross the curve. This is also wrong. The line touches the curve at point P, but it is clearly not a tangent line. Finally, you may have written that a tangent line to a curve is a line that just grazes the curve at a point but does not cross the curve. This is also wrong. The line shown is tangent to the curve at point P, but it does cross the curve as well. Without a true definition of a tangent line, we're kind of flying blind. Still, we all have an idea of what a tangent line looks like. I can't define a duck, but I know one when I see it. So you may want to first turn off your video, and then on page 4 of your manual, use your calculator to sketch the curve, and then draw in what you believe to be the tangent line at the indicated point. Here are the first four answers. In number 1, the graph is a line. And the tangent line to a line is the line itself. So no matter where we want to draw the tangent line, it will always be the line itself. In number two, the tangent line is at x equals zero is a horizontal line. In number three, the tangent line at x equals one is a horizontal line. It does cross the graph. And in number four, the tangent line at x is equal to one is a diagonal line.
In number five, the tangent line to y is equal to the absolute value of 3 minus x at x is equal to 3 doesn't exist. Later in the course, we'll find out why. In number six, the tangent line to the curve at x is equal to 0 just grazes the curve. In number seven, the tangent line at x is equal to pi crosses the curve. And in number eight, the y is equal to the square root of 4 minus x. The tangent line at x is equal to 4 is a vertical line. Don't be concerned if you did not get all of these. We have still have not defined what a tangent line is, so we're only doing it based upon instinct.